Have you ever had the displeasure of experiencing negative 40 degree weather? That's Celsius and Fahrenheit, because negative 40 is the point where the two converge. It's a temperature so cold that it's impossible for snow to fall. If you've never felt it, allow me to explain what it's like. Your eyelashes will turn white with frost. They'll start collecting humidity from your breath, forming icicles that make each lash stick to the other. Every time you blink, it's a struggle to reopen your eyes. Even if you try not to blink, the air is so dry that you have to, otherwise your eyeballs start to hurt. With each inhale, your nose hairs freeze and shoot needles of pain up your nasal canals. Your coat, no matter how thick or expensive, stiffens like a pair of jeans forgotten to dry at the bottom of the washer. You'll hear your clothes crackle like a down comforter with every move you make. Any exposed skin starts to burn. Your extremities freeze and no matter how much you rub your hands, your fingers go numb. You feel compelled to move around and try to warm up, but moving lets more cold air through the openings in your clothes. If you're lucky, moving will warm you up a bit. But if you're not, you'll start to feel very hot. Too hot. A burning sensation will run up your spine and you'll start to sweat. This means you've reached the danger zone. The point where cold no longer feels cold and you start shedding your clothes to avoid overheating. That's how you wind up dead. No matter how thin your gloves, how little your coat seems to help. In negative 40 degree weather, they're essential. They're a barrier between you and the biting chill. They're the only things that can help keep you alive. So why am I saying this? Well, I want to tell you about something that's been going on for decades in Saskatoon. Gruesome cases of human rights violations come to be known as the Saskatoon Freezing Deaths. Before I started my story, I wanted you to understand how truly horrible it must be for its victims. You see, officers in Saskatoon have a very original way of dealing with drunken Native Americans. In the middle of winter, they've been known to arrest drunkards, drive them outside of town, strip them to their underwear, and tell them to walk it off. As you might expect, the victims die of hypothermia long before they can make it back home. It is not known how many have died this way. A quick search of missing sisters, an unrelated issue where aboriginal women have gone missing, assumed dead, will show you just how little the police and authorities care about the plight of Native Americans. Participants of the Midnight Blue Tour have allegedly been found frozen on the side of the roads, and their deaths swept under the rug. However, from time to time, victims' bodies won't be found at all. The footprints turn to drag marks leading into the forest, but no blood or animal tracks are ever left to explain what was doing the dragging. The officers never investigate these cases further. You might be wondering where I fit into all this. See, my friend's uncle went missing this winter. A few people came forward saying they'd seen a cop throwing him in his squad car and driving off, but... There are no records of him getting booked. Here in Saskatoon, we'd all heard the rumors about the Midnight Blue Tour, but it was one of those things we never talked about. No one wanted to blab about the abuse of power because we didn't want to be the next victims of it, you know? In any case, let me take you back to when Paul first knocked on my door with the news. That morning, I was getting ready for work when my friend Paul knocked on my door. As soon as I opened it, a wave of cold air came rushing over my bare feet. I was quick to let Paul in and close the door. My friend shuffled from foot to foot, rubbing his arms furiously to try and warm himself up. I shuddered. Brr, colder than my ex-wife's heart out there, I mumbled. What's up, man? Paul pointed to the kitchen. C -c -c Coffee. I nodded. Yeah, hold on, I'll get a pot started. Paul kicked off his boots and shuffled to the living room. As I started the coffee machine, I could still feel the chill lingering in the air. The kitchen window was caked with so much frost that I couldn't even see outside. It was going to be one of those days. I hoped I'd managed to get my truck started. A few minutes later, I found Paul covered all the way up to his nose in my Nana's knitted blanket, eagerly waiting for me to deliver his coffee. As much as he seemed to thirst for it, he barely let his hand escape the cover of the blanket to take the cup when I offered it. He pulled it under the blanket, up to his mouth, and drank a large sip. Jesus, Paul, you can't be that cold. Paul shivered. Car broke down a mile and a half back. 
had to walk, he said, still stuttering from the cold. I looked out the window to my truck, sitting alone in the parking lot. What the hell are you doing driving in this part of town at five in the morning anyways? He sipped his coffee. Looking for my uncle. I got a call last night. He got picked up by the cops. I felt an instant sinking feeling in the pit of my stomach. The way he said it made it sound so much worse than what it should have been. So you were going to bail him out? Paul looked me straight in the eyes, and I knew what he was going to say. I knew what had happened to his uncle. He never made it to jail. Even though we were alone, even though we were in my house, I still found myself looking over my shoulder and lowering my voice to a whisper. These were the kind of things we never discussed. Ever. You think he took the Midnight Blue Tour? Paul nodded. Yeah. He finished his coffee and held the mug out to me. I filled it, handed it back, and left the pot on the living room table. I had a feeling he'd eventually want a third serving. He continued. Got a call half an hour after they took him. Thought maybe I could save him, but... He paused, the eyebrows coming together. Too many roads, in and out of town. I scratched my stubbly chin. Shit, I whispered. My eyes wandered to the clock, and Paul's gaze followed. We both knew it would be too late now. Will you help me find his body? Asked Paul. I don't want to drag you into this, but like I said, my car... He trailed off. Yeah, of course, I answered. You warm up. I'll start the truck and call off work, okay? He nodded, but said nothing more. Soon after, we were on the road with a thermos full of coffee and another full of warm soup. I was bundled up tighter than a toddler, going on his first snow luge ride, and Paul had borrowed an extra scarf and hat. It was even worse outside than I thought. Even with the heat at maximum, I could still feel cold emanating from the windshield. I had to point the heating ducts right at the steering wheel to keep my fingers from freezing. Meanwhile, Paul held the thermos and stared off into the distance, a defeated look in his eyes. I couldn't blame him. We were on a mission to find the frozen remains of the man who'd practically raised him, all because a cop had a bit of a power trip and a burning hatred for Native Americans. You know which bar he was at? I asked. Yard and flagon, he replied. Why? He'll probably be on that side of town, I answered. He shook his head. I already checked all the roads around there. I think he was dropped off farther away. I stopped the car and reached into the glove compartment for a map. I had Paul mark off all the roads he checked already, and then we headed for the next one. We went up and down road after road, not finding a trace of his uncle. That is, until a few hours later, when we finally spotted a subtle breach in the wall of snow on a road on the opposite side of town. I slowed the truck to a stop, unbuckled, and jumped out to examine it. Paul followed behind. The cold January air sent an instant shiver down my spine. I suddenly understood why Paul had practically chugged the coffee earlier. The cold wasn't just a little nippy. It was downright assaulting. Even when you've grown up with the cold, there's really no way to prepare for negative 40 degrees. I hugged myself as I inspected the three-foot-tall snowbank. There was an imprint the size of a human body. If that wasn't proof enough of his uncle's presence, then the bare footprints leading up to the indents sealed his fate. We'd found the right spot. What? Where'd he go? Asked Paul, a hint of panic in his voice. Maybe someone picked him up already? Paul climbed the mound of snow and looked out towards the forest. No, look! I followed him up the snowbank. It emitted crunching sounds beneath my feet, but didn't break. The cold had turned the usually soft and sticky snow into the consistency of styrofoam. I followed Paul's gaze and saw a path of fissured snow leading to the forest. This, I realized, meant Paul's uncle had been dragged into the woods. A prospect that pleased neither of us. Bear? I asked. Paul shook his head. I could tell he'd already gone through all the scenarios in his head. Bear... Wolf, serial killer on a snowmobile, he squinted. He looked at me with big, brown, hopeful eyes. I didn't want to tell him that it was impossible. I didn't want to point out that even if he was right and his uncle had gone into the woods, he had surely died of exposure long before finding a cabin. That's not what friends do. Friends help friends. Even when it's negative 40 out and all you want to do is curl up in front of the fireplace and hibernate until winter's over. Paul still had hope, so we pressed on. Let's check it out, 
I said. The snow on the other side of the embankment was about two feet high, but thankfully it had been so condensed and hardened by the frigid air that I could easily walk over it without breaking through. Paul and I kept a few meters distance from one another to even out the distribution of weight over the terrain. We hurriedly approached the edge of the woods where his uncle's tracks came to an abrupt stop, exactly on limit between the small field of snow and the first row of trees. By all logic, if the tracks stopped, then we should have found his uncle, but his uncle was nowhere to be seen. What the hell? He should be here. Where'd he go? Snow's probably too hard for tracks. Come on, he can't be far said Paul, stepping into the woods. While it was true that the snow cracked less inside the woods than out, I still saw it fissuring every few steps. There's no way Paul's uncle, a man twice my weight and two feet taller than me, could have managed to walk over it without breaking it. Paul, however, didn't seem to notice. He continued on, distancing himself from me to cover more ground. He called out his uncle's name over and over, even as his voice became raspier and weaker. By now, I was already regretting having left the thermos in the truck. Even with my winter gear, I could feel the cold snap snipping at the skin around my eyes, easily infiltrating my clothes. My lashes, now bright white, were winning a battle to permanently glue my eyes shut. I tried hard to breathe through my nose to avoid dampening my scarf, but I found myself panting to try and keep up with Paul and inevitably a blanket of moist frost settled over the portion of fabric covering my mouth. It melted whenever I exhaled, but froze again when I inhaled. The sometimes soggy, sometimes frosty material rubbed against my lips, irritating my skin. Oh shit, what the fuck? screamed Paul. What the fuck? I heard an ear-piercing shriek that cut through the cold, dry air like a blade. His scream was dizzying, nauseating even. It caught me so off guard that I momentarily froze. Still, I was able to look up just quickly enough to catch a silhouette running away before I heard the sound of snow breaking under the pressure of Paul's fall a short distance from the figure. I ran over to him and helped him back up. Did you see that? He asked, panicked. There's someone here with us. Yeah, I replied. Paul shook his head. That wasn't a person. Those words would have sent a chill down my spine if I wasn't already so cold. What are you talking about? Man, it... it... He swatted snow off his pants. It wasn't human, man. I turned towards where I'd seen the silhouette. You've had too much coffee. Paul turned whiter than rice in a snowstorm. I know what I saw. We need to go back. Right. Fucking. Now. I'm telling you, man. We need to get back to the truck. But I started. Now! He screamed. He grabbed my arm and yanked me so hard I thought I was about to lose a limb. Paul had this look of deep, primal fear in his eyes. I followed him out the woods, partially because I couldn't break out of his vice-like grip and partially because he genuinely seemed terrified and that, in turn, freaked me out. He didn't speak, not until we were safely in the truck where the doors locked and the engine on. What happened? I asked. Drive. I started down the road, not too fast, thinking he'd come to his senses and ask me to turn back for his uncle. What the fuck is wrong with you? Paul shivered and I had a feeling it wasn't from the cold. It looked like my uncle, he murmured. It? The thing we saw! He snapped back. I don't know what you saw, but I just saw some guy, I replied. It wasn't a man, he whispered. Paul, what the fuck are you talking about? He didn't answer. No matter how much I pushed him, he wouldn't tell me what he saw. So I drove us back to my place and escorted him inside. It was only when he removed his hat and scarf that I noticed a stream of blood had poured out of his ears. Jesus Christ, Paul, what the hell happened to you? Paul sat on the couch and pulled Nana's blanket up to his chin. He rocked back and forth, though I'm not sure if it was from the trauma or the cold. It looked like my uncle. <sighs> you said that already, I groaned as I turned up the heat. Paul's teeth clattered together. Again, it was a toss of the coin to know whether it was from fear or the cold. It came up to me, man. This thing. It was floating. Hovering over the ground. Didn't you see it? I shook my head. I just saw a silhouette, that's all. It wasn't a person. I saw it up close. He said, shuddering. It had this weird cloak on, man. It kinda... I could see it moving. Not the fabric, but the pattern on it. Like a night sky with clouds and stuff. It wasn't normal. And... And I could see its face. 
It looked just like my uncle, but it wasn't him. He... Paul looked over his shoulder and then back at me. Had no eyes. Just, just empty sockets. Like some kind of... monster. And his skin. Oh, shit. It was all black. Like rotten skin. Black like... like some intense fucking frostbite shit. And his mouth. Mother of fuck. His lips were purple and his teeth. They were sharp. All of them. When he screamed at me, I saw all the way down his throat. They were pointy and sharp all the way to the back. I stood there in stunned silence, trying to make sense of what he was saying. Wait, he... I started. It. He corrected. It screamed? I thought that was you. He shook his head. I remember the disorientation I felt when I heard the shriek. There was something off about it, but it hadn't even occurred to me that the sound hadn't come from Paul. The scream felt... Felt like I was being stabbed right in the ears with ice. It was like a brain freeze, but a full body brain freeze. I was paralyzed, man. Fucking paralyzed. But then he looked me in the eyes and just kind of shot away. And I fell. I took a seat, unscrewing the lid off a thermos. I wasn't sure which one it was until I took a gulp, but I didn't care. Coffee or soup, the warmth is what I wanted. But it seemed like no matter how much I drank, I couldn't cast away the chill. It felt like the cold was coming from inside me. Fear was what I was feeling, not the biting negative 40 degree weather, because somehow, deep inside me, I knew. Paul was right. I hadn't seen the silhouette clearly, but when I thought about it, when I replayed the moment in my head, I didn't see any legs touching the ground. Paul's uncle's body was never found. I don't think either of us expected it to turn up, and as expected... The disappearance was swept under the rug. So, why am I only talking about this now? Why am I in the middle of this hot summer day, sharing a story about the dead of winter? It's because something happened this morning, something that left me sweating, and not from the heat. This morning, exactly six months to the day that Paul's uncle went on a midnight blue tour, Officer McKay was reported missing. <clears throat> Drag marks were found next to his bed, broken fingernails were dug deep into the wooden floorboards, and ten bloody scratchy streaks, one for each finger, were found leading all the way down the stairs and out the door. They continued down his gravel parking lot, forming rake-like grooves led through the grass. They continued down his gravel parking lot, forming rake-like grooves led through the grass and made it all the way up to the edge of the forest. That's where Officer McKay's tracks end. There were no animal tracks left to explain what was doing the dragging. McKay is one of the five cops who have inexplicably gone missing in the past 40 years. A lot of people know about the horrible things that happened here in Saskatoon, but no one ever wants to talk about them. The police disappearances are just another thing we sweep under the rug. Just like the Midnight Blue Tours. <laughs>